Iulis into space. So that summary was very, very brief and concise. That's one hour's mission that's summed up in a one minute and a half. So we'll go back to the inside with Josh. Right, thanks, Pierre. We have the first of many films and interviews uh, coming up for you now. The first is on the Ce soir, et ça va être sur le contrat uh, de service de lancement avec Ariane Espace. Et c'est Pierre Yves. Uh, uh, ESA is a faithful customer of Vega for Earth observation. Aeolus will come after Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, launched with Vega in 2015 and 2017. As the first wind profiler in space, Aeolus is a challenging was supported for many years by highly motivated people, some of which attend the launch today. For them, it is the result of hard work and perseverance. On Aeolus, preparation for launch was achieved in several steps. Early studies allowed consolidation of the performance required for Vega, given the satellite mass and its operational orbit. Dedicated meetings were held to review the key aspects of a launcher mission. A visit to CSG was organized to allow specialists assess the facilities for preparation of a satellite and anticipate the need for specific ground means. A few months prior to launch, the final mission analysis was initiated. The documentation produced by Iron Space was reviewed by a customer and served to configure the launch base means. The launch campaign started early July, and as a final step, authorization for launch was submitted to the different regulatory bodies. We at Iron Space, along with our partners, Avio and ESA, in its role of Vega Qualification Authority, are proud to serve the IOLUS mission. Pierre-Yves Bertin in the film mentioning the AOLIS team's hard work and perseverance, they needed it. There was a very, very long development time for this project. Some of the people working tonight have been on the project for nearly 20 years, so it's a big night for them. Pierre, back to you. As you know, as you're a, um, an aficionado of our video transmissions, we often show you French Guiana's towns from the air. We've shown you Kourou, Cayenne, and Sainte Marie, and now it's combining two neighboring settlements. In 1942, the two towns merged to become a single municipality, Montsinéry Tonnegrande. Today it is part of the CACL, the French Guiana Central and Coastal Conurbation Community. The municipality is located about 40 kilometers from Cayenne by road and 15 by canoe via the Cayenne and Montsinieri rivers. The Montsinieri river runs along the village. Picturesque Creole houses can still be found in the municipality. River tourism allows visitors to explore its forest landscapes and mangroves. Montsinieri is known for its mangrove oysters, which today have almost disappeared. But an oyster farmer is trying to reintroduce them. On June 28, 2015, Montsinéry Tonnegrande opened its Echo Museum, a place full of memories. The Echo Museum houses vestiges of former plantations and family heirlooms, memories of days gone by. The Bagne des Anémites, the penal colony where Indochinese prisoners were deported in the early 1930s, is located on municipal territory. An important place of remembrance for the town, the site contains numerous Amerindian and colonial vestiges. A trip by seaplane is a great way to visit the municipality and discover the leisure resort La Mangrove or the French Guiana Zoo, which showcases the region's rich biodiversity. The countdown proceeding normally coming up on nine minutes to go to liftoff of Vega and uh, Aeolus. At the top of the broadcast, we'd like to introduce some of the key players who make the mission happen. The Dramatis Personae, Area and Space High Command here. Stefan Israel, you saw, along with him, Roland Lager, the Chief Technical Officer, with them, Ettore Scardecchia of uh, Avio. These men will make the call should anything unexpected uh, come up tonight. Our stage is set. I'm going to go back to the broadcast booth. While I do that, I'll turn you back over to Pierre Junier for one last time. Pierre. So the launch campaign that enabled this uh, launch to be prepared, it lasts about uh, one month for the launcher and about two months for the satellite. It came, the satellite came by boat this time compared to the usual satellites that come by a plane, Aeolus could not have supported the differences in pressure that you find in a plane. 
It has, Aeolus has its specificities and its fragilities. So now we're going to show you a short summary of the launch campaign that involves numerous players here at the Guyana Space Center. We are nearing the end of this exciting launch campaign, which started about two months ago. On the 28th of June, the Aeolus satellite arrived in French Guiana by boat which is quite uncommon for Arrhenius Pass launch campaigns. The choice to come by boat was made to avoid the pressure changes which occur during takeoff and landing of an airplane and for which the payload is very sensitive. The satellite was transported to the S5 facilities at CSG the same day and was unpacked the day after. A fit check was performed to verify the interfaces between the satellite and the launch adapter. In this test, the air purge system was also checked. The purging system is introduced to keep the payload extremely clean as the slightest contamination could impact the mission performance. The contribution of INS Pass Payload, Environment and Interfaces Department to Aeolus project started well before the launch campaign. Indeed, this department is in charge to ensure the spacecraft qualification to Vega flight environment, to customize the flight adapter, which enable first to install the spacecraft on the launcher, then its good separations once the targeted orbit is reached. We are also in charge to verify the compatibility between this adapter and the satellite via different kind of compatibility checks called feed checks. Thus, for Aeolus, I participated in 2017 to separation tests and beginning of 2018 to the feed check, allowing to confirm the total compatibility, mechanical and electrical, of the two elements, adapter and satellite. For what concerns the launch campaign, the Payload Interface Technical Authority issues a technical specification to be respected during the different combined operations between spacecraft and upper part elements at the adapter and the ferry. These specifications enable to respect all the requirements of this equipment and of the satellite. In the following weeks, the electrical testing on the satellite was performed and the preparations for the fueling were completed. In the S5B fueling hall, the satellite was filled with the monopropellant hydrazine and next to this, the satellite was also filled with oxygen. The oxygen has no function in the propulsion system, but is used for in-orbit purging of the high-power lasers and the emission path optics. The oxygen purging is required to avoid any deposit of contamination, again to guarantee the extreme cleanliness of the payload. After the fueling operations, the combined operations phase was started with the integration of the Iolo spacecraft on its flight adapter. After final checks and inspections, the fairing was integrated around the spacecraft, forming the so-called pack. All along this combined phase, the technical authority worked in very close collaboration with the responsibles of operation, giving its technical support when needed and participating to the potential anomalies solving. The technical authority is also one of the spacecraft customer main contacts during the launch campaign, providing its support on technical topics. The dress rehearsal has been completed successfully from Jupiter 2. The launch readiness review has been held and the authorization to enter final chronology has been given. We are now entering the final phase of the countdown up to liftoff. Joshua Jampel back here in the booth uh, with Martin Kaspers of ESA. And I have your title, Head of Earth Observation Programs, Product Assurance and Safety. Is that all right? That's all right. So that means that you are looking at the insurance uh, policies? The, the, no, no, it's, it, it's, it's mainly the product assurance to check if we apply the right processes at the right time in the right way with the right people. Very good. Okay, so what's your, uh, uh, what's your average day on the ALOS project? Well, the average day is we, we check the procedures. We talk talk with uh, the contractors on, on testing and, and execution of everything. Okay, H how long have you been on the project? I started in 2005 on the structural model when it was tested uh, in Aztec in Noordwijk, the Netherlands, and since eight years I've been the uh, full-time product assurance manager. Okay, first time in Kourou, last question for you. No, no, this is the, at least the third time that I'm here. Okay. The uh, space-based activities can be summed up by these green status panels you see on the right of your screen. What they are is a go, no-go, green, red resume of everything it takes to prepare, a launch, and follow Vega. Green means okay, red means the opposite, of course. Very simple. We get a red in any of these areas, we will stop the countdown. And as you see, we are go. And you say you've seen a launch before. I saw the latest uh, Galileo launch in July. Uh from the beach? From the beach. I was in Kourou on the beach and it was very exciting. 
Okay, there are some 1,700 people working at the space base in all. It's a busy place. You don't have cameras everywhere. But we have one here, which is at the Vega Launch Management Center, about 14 kilometers away from Jupiter where we are. The men and women you see are only three kilometers from the pad, but they are protected inside a blockhouse with walls one meter thick. Liftoff is controlled from there, only liftoff. Overall mission control provided from here in Jupiter. The teams there led up uh, by Frederick Fakin, the Launch Complex Operations Manager. Any of your colleagues up there tonight? No, my colleagues are at the moment in S5 in the satellite control area. Which is, I guess, halfway between here and, uh, and the launch base. Uh, about right, yes. So right now the teams uh, that you see at the launch center are monitoring all the operations leading right down to liftoff. Once uh, Vega leaves the pad, their job is done. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of parameters to check. I guess you agree with me here, right? Basically what's happening now is that power is passing from the ground, which controls everything now, to the Vega onboard computers, which will control everything after liftoff. Under two minutes to go. Now, I know you're going to go outside and watch the launch before you go. Just tell me what's going through your mind right now after all these years on the project. And I'm feeling quite emotional at the moment. And I don't know what, uh, how I will react when I see it really going up. But uh, it's such a long program. And uh, let's, let's see it going up. All right. Well, we'll get your reaction when you come back. Martin's going to go outside. You see the other people uh, here in the hall going out on the two terraces on either side of the building here. Vega, you get a good shot of uh, the launch pad, and they will see Vega rising up and going toward the north. Martin is going to be out there. He'll be back, don't know when, maybe after the separation of the first stage, maybe a little later. And we'll get his live reaction and his emotional reaction. DDO's going to announce the one-minute mark now. Attention, please. 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 So we are into the final 60 seconds. Give us a chance to say hello to all our friends at Airbus Defense and Space in Les Mureaux, back in uh, France, at ESA headquarters in Paris, ESTEC and ESAC and ESRIN, all of our industrial partners as well, as we look at the spectators gearing up for the liftoff. To all of you watching on the internet, also we all hope you're enjoying the evening. We're going to cut away and let you enjoy the liftoff. You will hear the DDO call out the final 10 seconds and we'll be underway. Enjoy the liftoff, everyone. À tous de DDO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage P80 et décollage VV12 Aeolus. La propulsion est nominale. La trajectoire est nominale, la propulsion du P-80 est nominale. The DD, DDO says all is fine on board. You saw Vega take off like a shot. I'm always amazed. It took her about three seconds to cross uh, my computer screen here. Three seconds, rising like an arrow. Surprisingly fast if you're used to watching the Ariane 5 lift off. Ariane 5, of course, raises, raises into the air much more slowly, weighs uh, six times what Vega does, carrying four times as much propellant. Fine shots of her rising into the light clouds. All is well on board, says the DDO. Vega weighing 138 tons at liftoff as she lifts off from French Guiana, beginning the 12th mission in her career. They call her the light launcher at 138 tons, but I guess that's relative. The first stage is burning now. She weighs 97 tons, 88 tons of that are fuel. Most of any launcher's weight is propellant in any system that we're using today. The first stage burns its single engine for about two minutes before being jettisoned. Maybe we'll be able to see that as our camera is tracking Vega, because visibility is pretty good. First stage is produced in Colifero near Rome. 
been delivered to the French Guiana plant here where it's loaded with fuel and transferred to the booster integration building. You probably saw some of that on the video on the launcher campaign. And having returned with a big smile on his face, before separation is Martin Casper. So, uh, how is it? Incredible. Tell us. <laughs> you, you see it, you feel it, and all the emotion that comes loose. I, uh, it's great. <laughs> you're, you're laughing. Did no, you? no it's, it's not laughter. <laughs> yes, it's laughter, but also cry. Did, uh, you, did you cry? Did, did, did you shed a tear? I did shed a tear. That's great. What, what, uh, what uh, impressed you the most? The sound, the speed, the light, what? The, the, the light was so bright, I had not expected that from such a small launcher. Mm. I saw the Galileo uh, or the, the Ariane launch, but yeah. this was much brighter than I had expected. It's like Times Tout Square out there, you can read a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very good. Come down and watch a launch, folks, if you haven't already. P-80, first stage separation has come on time. The, f the second stage uh, is burning. We're into the second stage uh, burn called uh, the second stage, the Z-23, Z for Zephyro. Burns its solid rocket motor for 86 seconds. Avio, of course, responsible for production, integration, and testing of both second and third stages. Vega's launching north, going into a sun-synchronous orbit. Why do we need that sort of an orbit? We need it for uh, Aeolus, for the, for the instrument for Aladdin. Uh, we want to have a disk to dawn orbit so that we're always fa in the sunlight. And uh, it's also the best way to measure the wind profile. And the orbit is called, uh, they have a name for it, it's a uh, ball of yarn orbit, right? Explain that to us. It is basically you go uh, north to south pole while the Earth is rotating underneath of you. And in this way, you peel off uh, the Earth completely. You saw separation of the second stage. We're waiting for confirmation by the DDO of the third stage, ignition of the third stage. Allumage and there you are, right on time. And Et coming up next, coiffe. separation of the fairing. Nominal. All right on time. We can separate the fairing now because we've made it out of the atmosphere. Now, exposed to the elements, the right, on the right, the uh, round white section, that's your baby. That's, well, the baby is the, the cubical and the white uh, part of it in total, yes. So she needs no more protection from the atmosphere. She's getting her first taste of space. Of space, but not the first taste of vacuum. She was tested in CSL Belgium. Uh, right, we have a story about that Come, coming up. First, we're used to seeing, here's a question for you, commercial satellites, 15-year lifespan, maybe more. Three years for Aeolus. Why is that? Well, Aeolus is uh, one of the Earth explorers, and it's also a technology demonstrator. And because of the small size, uh, we have less fuel on board than the telco satellites have. Right. So, h how much fuel, roughly? We have about 266 kilograms of fuel on board for a free emission. Nominal. And the other thing is geostationary satellites are geostationary. They use less fuel to stay in orbit. Now, why is that? Because they are geostationary, so they've got... Because they don't go round in the ball of yarn. Around. Exactly. Okay, very good. Another question for you. Aeolus is riding inside the album. That's the upper stage. What is Aeolus doing now? I ask you because sometimes satellites are launched on internal power. Sometimes they're not on internal power. They are two schools of thought, and they're, they're advantages for both sides. What's the case today? Well, for Aeolus, we are on internal power since ten, about 10 minutes before launch. Uh -huh. So we made sure that our baby is awake and uh, running its own internal pro processes. And what's the advantage to that? The advantage is that we know that the spacecraft is on. You can also switch it on in orbit through a telecommand. But then if you miss it, it will not come on, go on. The disadvantage of what we're doing now is that you're in internal power, so you're draining the battery. You're, you're using some of that you, power. Exactly. Yeah, but I guess there's a case to be made for both sides. That's a, a hot debate in the uh, space industries. Uh, as I see it, Vega means, excuse my Italian, Vettore Europeo di Generazione Avanzata, or Advanced Generation European Vehicle. The light launcher is the newest member of the Ariane family. Coming up on separation of the third stage, there you are, right on time. Confirmation from the DDO. Now what's left of the composite on the left the triangular bit is the album, triangular white bit. The gold box in the middle is what? 
that's the, what we call the platform. So that's basically containing all the equipment to keep the, uh, the satellite in the right orbit. And you can still see the composite on the right of your screen. And of course, the spherical, the oval, white on the bottom is the telescope, the telescope, which is part of the instrument, Aladdin. Aladdin, very good. We'll have more on the instruments uh, coming up later. We ha have been picked up by our downrange uh, tracking stations. There's one here in Gallio. The next one is uh, in the Bermuda Islands, where there's a NASA station. Bermuda will be tracking the launcher from the first AVA ignition to its uh, cutoff on the first pass around the Earth. See, see how we're going, going north. You see the composite being spun up before the first ignition of the album. The, fir the first ignition, a long one, lasting about eight minutes. There will be another one later on, a short one, lasting about 20 seconds. Tell us about some of the other uh, stations. I know there's some stations far north, Norway, Sweden, and Antarctica, that are going to be picking up the signal after the Bermuda station. Yeah, so we have one uh, telemetry station in uh, Kuruna, Sweden. That is where we uh, upload data uh, for the control of the spacecraft. And then we've got two ground stations in... Uh, there's the, while you're thinking, there's the beginning of the first uh, album uh, burn. Okay, one is in Svalbard and the other one is in Troll, and there we... Uh, download the science data from the spacecraft. The troll station in, a, in Antarctica will give us uh, the final uh, acquisition of the signal later on. Vega's history, briefly, it's interesting though, she grew out of an early US missile called Scout, you may remember. Italy used the Scout from the 60s through the 80s and it flew 27 times. Impressive. Yeah. Launching originally from Wallops Island off Virginia, sort of on the flight path tonight north uh, over the east coast of the U.S. Then she launched from the San Marco platform off the coast of Kenya. This was an old oil platform, if you can believe that, on the equator, like Kuru is n near the equator. In 1992, Scout production was closed down, but the project continued as an Italian venture called the San Marco Scout, led by ASI, the Italian Space Agency, and Avio. So you see Avio has been involved since the beginning. DDO says Bermuda is picking up the signal now. Our next film, a look at Aeolus close up. In August, the European Space Agency will launch its latest Earth Explorer mission, Aeolus. The mission aims to further improve our understanding of winds and help increase the accuracy of weather forecasts. But this new satellite is unlike any other. For example, its shipment to Kourou is by boat rather than plane, because the sudden increase in atmospheric pressure upon landing could damage some of its delicate instruments. Aeolus is also the first space mission to acquire wind profiles on a global scale. This wind data is needed to create weather forecast and climate models. Today, meteorologists have to analyze winds by using weather balloons, tracking clouds, measuring temperature, and looking at sea waves for surface winds. These methods, however, have severe limitations and give insufficient data. All of these systems are not measuring all over the globe at all altitudes from the surface all the way up to the top of the atmosphere. And in order for the model to get the winds right, they need more observations. And this is where the Aeolus satellite will come in. Aeolus will measure winds from the surface or from optically thick clouds all the way.